At this point, um, I'm going to open the public hearing on the notice of intent for Smith College's application to uh, to try to reclaim an old field and turn it into a more functional, uh, resilient forest. And, and Scott, will I will I be able to vote since I wasn't at the um, site walks? Yeah, you can vote because we okay. can describe to you what we saw. Okay. As long as you've reviewed the materials, that's fine. And we won't be voting tonight anyway because um, we need to one get a file number from uh, from Mark right. Stinson, and we haven't gotten that yet. And second, we need to hear from Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program what their opinion is in terms of whether this meets the performance standards for uh, protecting uh, rare and, and, and endangered wildlife habitat. Okay. So um, what we'll do is we'll start the hearing, we'll have conversation, we'll decide if there's anything additional that we need in terms of uh, materials, and then um, we'll, we'll uh, with the applicant's permission, uh, we will then uh, extend the hearing or uh, till the next, till, till our January meeting, and then uh, hopefully be able to wrap things up then. Okay. So, um, Paul, I'd like you to describe the project because, you know, there are people that watch the recordings of our meetings and, and it, we want to make sure that we have a reasonably uh, complete record of, of what's going on. Do you want to share your screen in order to show us maps or do you want me to share the maps that I have? Um, if you've got them up, it will just save a little time uh, yeah, to sure. share them. You could... Um, I mean, I can, uh, I have all three, I have three, three maps that are up. Uh, I think that, the, I think that the, the, um, one that shows the priority habitat areas first and, and the parcel and, and the project area is, is fine. I don't think the USGS map is. Okay. I mean, unless you think that people want to see the USGS map. Well, why don't I just flash it up briefly just so people right. have a context of where it is and then we'll move okay. on to the next one. Okay. Um, okay. So my name's Paul Wetzel and um, I manage the McLeish Field Station for Smith College. And also one of my colleagues, Becca Malloy, is here as well. Um, and uh, the McLeish Field Station is at the end of Poplar Hill Road. Um, and you can see that right up through here. And the boundaries of the field station are in yellow on this map. Um, there's 250 acres total. It turns out, at least from uh, a look at some aerial photographs from the 1970s. It turns out that most of this parcel, 23-0-5, uh, was uh, actually old field mode or something, uh, grazed um, in the 70s. And um, after the college bought it in 1962, I, they stopped doing anything to it. So slowly, um, that old field became kind of invaded with either um, multiflora rose or bittersweet or autumn olive or barberry. It's a pretty common trajectory now. Um, and so this whole side of um, about 30 acres of that parcel is, is, is in that form. So there's the, so we're not going to worry about the whole 30 acres. We're going to worry about about seven and a half right now. And that's what this um, orange project area is, is designating. So if you go to the next map, um, this shows um, the same orange um, project area. And what this is, is kind of, it starts at the top of a hill and then the, the hill slopes down towards Jimmy Nolan Brook. And this is just part of a long ridge, and that hill just extends northward and southward a little bit um, all the way through the property boundaries. 
this tends to be a little not the steepest part, which is good. Um, but um, so we've we've designated Jimmy Nolan Brook on the map, and we put 200 feet on either side. That's what the the pink is, and there's also a little intermittent stream that starts draining the top of the ridge and goes by um, the project area that has 100 feet on either side. That's the um, aqua blue. And that goes into Jimmy Nolan Brook eventually. Also, you should note that there are um, two natural heritage uh, designated areas. One is estimated have they they both have the same um, they have the same boundaries, but they want they're both co they're called estimated habitat ten twenty eight and priority habitat fourteen eighty three, and that this green olive green boundary is is the northern part yeah there so and that is a different one but we're we're not in that so almost i don't know about 80 percent of the project area is in this priority or estimated habitat so um and then if uh just looking at the um here, the, the dotted yellow line is again, the, the project boundary. And what this is, is this is actually an aerial photo. That's a drone photo from uh, late September, early October. Um, and I've designated um, wetland boundaries um, in, the, in, in the project area. And I've also, shown the priority estimated habitat, which is gray straight line going through it. So that's the same same lines going through it. And um, this is a little different than the one that I sent. Well, I sent you this copy, but a um, little different in that um, after our site visit, you asked me to look and see which of these wet, these wetland areas um, might be connected to Jimmy Nolan Brook, which is to the uh, right-hand side to the east. And I did that and I looked pretty extensively and found that really the last, the bottom or the lower three in, in, uh, in kind of a blue color um, were the ones that were sliding in and the water was coming out and sliding along and then if you recall, if you were there, we were standing at this corner, this south southeast corner, and watching the water slide kind of through the. There's a stone wall, and um, and then it slid down, and it goes down towards Jimmy Nolan Brook. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think one. Yeah. So the other ones didn't have a surface water uh, connection. I think they have some sort of underground hydrologic connection. I wouldn't be surprised, but I think there's a lot of water on that whole hillside there. So um, interestingly enough, this is a little bit off the topic a little bit, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, these, these wet areas have a lot of native wetland plants in them. And I was, I actually had not until this summer, um, I had not really been in this area. It's very difficult to maneuver through here. And the way we eventually ended up doing it is we just ended up cutting trails, small two foot wide trails that are um, perpendicular to the slope to get access in there because the roses and, and, the, and the vines are so thick that it's hard to um, move. And so, um, I was pleasantly surprised at the the number of um, native plants that are not thriving, but they're doing okay. You know, they're living, they're being um, suppressed by the roses mostly, and any tree just gets swallowed up by bittersweet. But that's but they're there. So that was that was a pleasant surprise. So I'll, the idea is is to um, spray use herbicides to spray the um, invasives and to cut 
vines. There's some, some vines have been cut already, um, but cut vines and spray the stumps and probably cut down the Asian or the autumn olive um, and spray those stumps. Um, so it's just a lot of handwork. Um, but the roses in particular, it would be nice to be able to spray them with herbicide. So I don't, I'll, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I see this as like a two or three. I mean, we started working here. Um, if you look up at the top of the hill, there's, there's some, we did some mechanical removal of the, of the roses. There's um, some, a big pile of brush there that was pointed out. Um, but I, this is like a two or three year project and, um, yeah, <laughs> kind of. <fun. laughs> right, I haven't answered any questions, really. It's yeah. Fun. So I think just to summarize a little bit from our site visit, um, you know, we walked around this area and we walked through some of the seeps, but it is, you know, so overgrown with invasives that it's like impossible to really get all the way in and and look at everything. So uh, one of the things that that came up in the site visit was whether some or all of these uh, wetlands were jurisdictional because uh, under the Wetlands Protection Act, wetlands are protected when they border on a river, stream, lake, or pond. And uh, if it's isolated and, and not bordering one of those water bodies or waterways, then it's not jurisdictional uh, under the Wetlands Protection Act. So, um, it looked like some of these were isolated and yet others down near the stone wall at the base of the, at the lowest elevation of the, of the project area did look like they may have a channelized connection that leads down to wetlands that, that abut uh, Jimmy Nolan Brook. Right. And so the request to Paul was to, to, to identify which of those polygons were connected down below and which ones are isolated. So, that's this is a revised version of the map that was originally sent where the polygons in blue are those that do have a surface water connection and therefore are jurisdictional for us. And uh, presumably the other ones in white uh, are are isolated and therefore uh, non jurisdictional. Uh, so we have to determine whether we are going to, you know, sort of have a finding as to which of these polygons are jurisdictional and which ones are not. And then um, my understanding, Paul, is your intention is to uh, any jurisdictional wetlands, you will not be spraying within the wetland boundary, but only working within the buffer zone to those wetlands, correct? But, yeah, and the other ones too, for that matter. Okay. Just because a lot of the plants don't, uh, or the, the, the four, invasives that I'm mostly concerned with um, don't really live in wetlands. You know, it's not a, so I consider this pretty much, pretty much a boundary project all the way around. Although I will say that in some of these larger places, there's like, there might be a hummock or something, not a hummock, but a, a, a drier spot and there'll be a rose bush on it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's my understanding that, you know, at this point, if, whether you um, confine yourself to the bu uh, the buffer zone or not around those around anything we deem as non jurisdictional is is up to you. Right, it's not something that we need to 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 decide on. So that that's my summary, and uh, certainly, um, and Andy, if you have any uh, any any comments or clarification on on my description of the of the site walk, feel free to add in. No, it's pretty straightforward what you said, Scott, I think. Yeah, so, I said Scott as well. Okay. So, so I was, can I just make another comment? Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, um, I just want you all to know that I plan to do more of this, both north and south, um, in the future. So I, I, I anticipate being, coming before the, Conservation Commission in this, you know, sometime, probably next, I don't know when, but 
just just I'm I'm going to work northward and I'm going to go a little bit south too, which is a pain. But we'll see what Natural Heritage says first. But just so you know, I'm I'm I've got plans to move forward. So I mean, I don't I think it'll be kind of similar things. Just if that makes it you know helps. Just so you know, when you're when you're making a decision. I have a question about Nash, national heritage why are they uh why are we waiting on them what was the what was the thing that they need to approve on so the uh the, the regulations say that if someone proposes work within an area of estimated habitat for rare wetlands wildlife that they need to submit the notice of intent to the natural heritage and endangered species program and the conservation commission needs to wait until we get a response from natural heritage uh, because they will determine as part of their review whether this would cause any short or long-term adverse impact to the habitat for the rare wetlands wildlife that's mapped for, that it's mapped for so what is and, the, what's the rare uh um <laughs> the rare species involved the rare, yeah the rare species i i asked them they wouldn't tell me Okay, no, that's fine. I just was curious. I think if you file the right form and pay the fee, they will tell you. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, my my, if I were to guess, I'd say one possibility is is wood turtle, uh, right. that they may be coming up out of uh, Jimmy Nolan Brook. They do wander quite some distance from the streams during the summertime. Sure. Um, and so what the, the what the regulations say is that uh, any work in rare species, in habitat for rare wetlands wildlife cannot have any short or long-term adverse impacts on the habitat. Yeah. So then we get sent to natural heritage for their opinion as to whether there are going to be any short or long-term adverse impacts. Mm -hmm. And their opinion is presumed to be accurate unless there's a clear showing to the contrary. So in practice, that generally means that we accept whatever natural heritage has to say about it. And if they were to say that the project would have short or long-term adverse impacts, we would essentially be obligated to deny the project. Right. Okay. Heritage almost never says that. They have done it on rare occasions, but most of the time what they do is, is determine under what conditions they would issue a no adverse impact ruling. So they would say, we will say that there's no adverse First impact as long as you do this and this and this and this and this. So, for example, for uh, for wood turtle, they might uh, like if there was going to be equipment in there, and, and and there's no equipment proposed at this point. But if somebody was going to get in there with a tractor or a, a skitter or something like that, they might say, you know, do it only in when conditions are frozen, and the turtles are presumably in the streams and not in the fields and forests nearby. So these are the kind of the conditions that are fairly routine, uh, but sometimes they go well beyond that uh, as they address the specific needs of whatever rare wildlife is involved. And so that 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 Paul's only recently sent the NOI right. to to Heritage, so they have thirty days to review it and get back to us. And so we generally uh, will will extend the public hearing until we hear from them, and then then we can close the hearing and make a, a final decision. And they said that they would um, respond with either on or before the 17th of January. Okay. Which I believe is, that's our next meeting. Is it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yep. 17th. That's 17th. So right. that works. Um, are there other questions or comments? From the commission? Oh, just one random question from me for Paul. Have you ever considered like a prescribed burn for any of these areas, like to control the invasives or? Um, you mean in the project area? Yeah. Instead of like, you know, I know you said chemicals, but would burning help like, you know, control burn of that area, take down a lot of it? Or is it more just you have to mechanically just get rid of everything? physically get rid of it? Um, I, well, first of all, it might be a little bit, well, 
I haven't thought of using fire here. I've thought of using fire in other places. What I have thought of is using animals, goats, mm -hmm. to chew it, chew it down. But that doesn't necessarily, but there's, there's two things, two caveats to that. Um, one is they'll eat everything. So they'll eat all the animal or, you know, the native plants as well, which doesn't mean they'll die. They'll just eat them. And then the other thing is they won't, they'll just eat down and the plants will still be alive. Oh. But what it would do is it would allow you to, um, it would just, um, then they could grow back a little bit and then you could spray them. <laughs> It'd be more concentrated. Um, so I have, so I haven't used goats before, but I'm going to, I'm thinking about using it north and um, up above uh, on, on a hillside um, where it's not as wet and where there aren't as many native plants. Um, and so, but I, I don't know. I'm, I actually was, while I was doing this, I was thinking about, okay, we had talked about having a 15 foot um, buffer um, you know, around, you don't know, spray buffer. And, um, what would I do if I couldn't get in there? Um, I had thought while I was walking around, I could cut all the, I could cut the vegetation and probably have to do it by hand, but I could cut it. And then I could spray the stumps. Now that's still using herbicides, but it's not, it's much more concentrated. You're spraying the stumps. The, yeah, more pinpoint. Yeah, that's just fine. You know, and not the not the the leaves, mm -hmm. but it would take. And and if you make that condition, that's probably what I'll do for sure on these three um, wetlands, if I can. If you don't want me to do it, I won't. Um, and I just and so I just I'm not really sure how to how to um, control. Mostly, it's the rows. I mean, I feel pretty comfortable, you know, cutting out bittersweet and then spraying the stump. That's a very concentrated, you know, you're not just spraying it willy nilly. Um, I feel very comfortable about that, but I don't, I don't know about the, the rose. That one's harder mm -hmm. and I can't get in there to um, mechanically pull it out. Um, roses will come out pretty easily, but the, the, I can't get a tractor in there. It's too murky and too steep. I don't know. I didn't really answer your question. No, I, like I said, yes, I understand. It's a difficult sign. I was just trying to, yeah, just yeah. You know, other ideas. That, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sort of having second thoughts about the idea of having a setback. You know, personally, I'd rather see the invasives controlled effectively um, around the wetlands. And it might be something where the condition might be something like uh, that application be done by a person knowledgeable on about where the wetland boundaries mm -hmm. be able to recognize the wetland boundary and take steps to avoid uh, incidental, uh, you know, uh, like spray or spraying or treatment or something getting into the yeah. wetlands. You know? So yeah. if you were to say, well, the way that we will do that is by cutting the rows and treating the stumps rather than spraying the entire bush. You know that would be a way of ensuring that none of the spray gets into the wetland. Yeah, I mean it's just something I thought of while I was there. Um, yeah. Otherwise, it would be like a foliar application. Yeah, you yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I wait until it's not blooming because I don't want to, and then, and then you spray the leaves and. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's with a backpack sprayer. It's not, it's not with a drone. It's not overhead or anything. Um, and it's, it's pretty good, but there is drift. You're going to get drift. I, you just, no way around it. Um, yeah. Okay. Other questions or comments? I'm all set. Thanks. So I would, uh, uh, sorry, got a message from George. He's not feeling well, so he's not making it to the meeting. Um, I, so Paul, uh, one of the things that came up as you've probably seen in the emails uh, 
is anything that you send us like updated maps and updated language has got to go to DEP as well. Right. I and, thought I had done that. I didn't, but I thought I had. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll say I didn't, I was in the field this whole afternoon, so I didn't see those. So it's I will not a problem tomorrow. because we don't need the file number now because we're not going to be able to close the hearing anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also the, the DEP form, uh, the notice of intent form, uh, I think we'll need an updated version where you basically mark it as a buffer zone only project and take out all of that information about the restoration project um, because that's that's sort of misleading. So it would be just sort of correcting the form to reflect what it is you're proposing to do. So I tried to correct the forms. I don't know how to do it. I'm, I, uh, you, you don't have to use your meeting time to tell me but I'm having a hard, I tried and I don't know. And I even called someone and they said, well, once you submit it, it's submitted. I'm yeah, so what you can do is you go to DEP and look for the actual like PDF forms and, and, and word forms. And, and you can just fill those out and, fill and send out. it. Oh. And, and rather than go through EDEP, yeah, okay. which I never use because I find it very frustrating. So okay. you can just submit the form to us via email and send a copy to Mark. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll do that. Um, and, and I'll so, send Mark the, the, I'll send him what I sent. So, so far I, I, um, I sent the old NOI and I, and I sent these new maps and I sent, um, um, you know, the narrative all to, um, uh, plus their their own form all to natural natural heritage and i will send all that stuff that i i'll 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 fill mark in on all this too yes so, no problem yeah um i think i i might suggest that you um that if you i like this idea that you just brought up about when you're in the within a certain vicinity of the wetland that you, you you use a, an approach that's more concentrated, so, you know, like cutting and then applying to the stumps. And if you think that's a practical way to go, could you write that up and submit that as, as just uh, an addendum to your proposal? Because I think I like that better than the idea of an absolute setback. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay. How do other commissioners feel about that? That sounds good, because I think that would, like you said, concentrate the point source to a more point source than just a, you know, a broad well, setback, like you said, Scott. I'm okay with that too. I'm good with that. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you have any other questions for us? No, I, no, not now. <laughs> or Becca, anything you want to add? Commissioners, any more questions or comments? All right, no. Paul, uh, with your permission, I'd like to continue the hearing until our next meeting. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay, not going to so be that... working out there anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. So um, then th this hearing will be uh, continued until our January 17th meeting where we will reconvene at 7 o'clock. Okay. Uh, um, thank you all very much. I appreciate your understanding and your help and, and stuff. No problem. We, you know, you're you're doing stuff to try to enhance yeah. the environment. We're all in favor of that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Becca. And yeah. feel free to contact me if you have any questions or, or additional information to share. Okay. All right. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Um, um, we have the uh, certificate of compliance for Asami Farms, but there's no rush on that. So why don't we go on to you, Sylvie? Uh, and Sylvie uh, indicated she'd like to meet with us to talk about the pollinator habitat um, project that's going on. So the floor is yours. Hello. Um, so yeah, nothing terribly um, sophisticated or well-formed as of yet. I just wanted to um, just touch base with you all. Um, so after, um, I had asked you, you know, about um, if there were any particular areas that I might want to look at with uh, with Evan Abramson, um, who is from Landscape Interactions, um, and uh, I had attended his um, 
webinar um, pollinate now and reached out to him. Um, so you had mentioned um, that um, basically any town owned property would be a good place to start. Um, so I looked at a few different parcels with Evan and his colleague Casey. Um, and so the thoughts as of now um, and um, I submitted an expression of interest uh, for an action grant. Um, and just as an aside, I do have a check-in with um, our contact uh, there uh, for the MVP uh, tomorrow. So I'll also ask him about the, the culvert um, project. Um, but so um, an expression of interest um, for planning, for, uh, for a grant for planning. Um, and uh, right now we're thinking of like three to four locations possibly, um, two of them being um, around the town offices and in the back of the library. Um, and these spaces, um, it, it, it would it would be, it'd have the benefit of being um, ornamental and interactive and sort of be an educational uh, sort of uh, um, site where people could see what, what types of um, plantings were there and that sort of a thing. Um, and uh, so for those reasons, uh, for that reason, those are attractive spots. Um, and uh, we have a large amount of land around the town offices and um, in back of the library. And I, I did talk with Cindy uh, from the library and she felt that it would be beneficial to um, do something with that space that was um, pollinator focused and also would just enhance the space for visitors of the library. So that's the thought with those two spaces. Um, we looked at a couple others. Um, one other area that is of interest is the town property around the wells because it's near the Mill River, um, that space by I-91 where we have the protected land around the, the town water sources. Um, so we do have some invasives there. Um, and so that's something that we could target anywhere that we're doing this project. Um, and then because of its proximity to the Mill River um, and the town water sources, um, that would be a good place to um, put some thought into what might be most beneficial. Um, and so we are thinking about, you know, and I want to get if there's if there's any sort of feedback um, in terms of areas that could benefit from the habitat reconstruction in terms of flooding, um, which is in the which is in our vulnerability preparedness plan. Um, there's also so invasives um, are a concern as well as inland flooding. Um, and I think microbursts as well. Um, so we had sort of looked at some other spots like um, there's a very open field um, that uh, you know we could we could potentially work there, but um, to to just have like sort of a meadow grass. Um, that might have some uh, small benefit in terms of microbursts or just like pollination um, throughout the town, but um, just welcoming any, um, you know, sort of guidance in terms of most fruitful um, for this type of project, if you have other spots um, that we should look into, or if you have any concerns as well. All right. Anybody want to respond? It seems like there's no bad spot for pollinator habitat. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so my comments are that, um, you know, down by the town well, you have to be a little careful because there's a lot of natural heritage, a lot of rare species in the Mill River and around the edges. And so I think that when uh, when we had the emergency down there where we needed to reroute the, the, the Mill River, Mm -hmm. uh, winged monkey flower was one of the rare species that had to be dealt with. Okay. And, um, the, there, there are also probably some rare dragonflies as well. So, and there may be other plants. So it's one of those things where they'll need to be consulted really early on to see mm -hmm. if it's even feasible to do something like pollinator habitat. Although okay. it might be easier if, if it was just mostly a way of taming the, the invasive species and and enhancing right. the area that way. Um, so natural heritage, um, all right. Yeah, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. It's a part of the Massachusetts uh, Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Okay, all right, great. Yeah, um, and I will, uh, I'll let Evan know that that's um, something we have to 
we have to uh, take into account early on. Yeah, anytime you get near the Mill River, that's going to be an issue. Um, the, the the other thing that occurred to me, just more about invasive species control, less about pollinator habitat, but you mm -hmm. know, along the Mill River in some places, like along Swamp, where it crosses Swamp Road, and uh, along the West Brook in many mm -hmm. places, there's a lot of Japanese knotweed. Uh, that's coming in along the, along the shores on the banks and things, and uh, it is sometimes problematic in terms of uh, flood damage in that it does not it it's not uh, a per perennial plant, it, and it shades out other plants that might establish and create a better root system, and sometimes in places it leads to erosion. Because if you get flooding, like in the springtime before it sprouts, uh, the soil gets washed away. And, and, and over time, you can lose a significant amount of elevation on the banks of, of water bodies as a result. So it is a, a remarkably difficult plant to try to control. Um, mm -hmm. And it's almost always going to require some kind of chemical treatment because they have enormous uh, stores of carbohydrates below the ground. And they'll just re-sprout over and over and over again. Mm. Uh, if you try to do it mechanically, but yeah, uh, just letting you know of where where there are big inv invasive issues uh, that also intersect with water and 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 potentially might affect flooding or or at least storm damage. Because yeah, that was the one I was thinking. I couldn't think of the plant name. You said it's got the knotweed all along uh, the Christian Lane, going towards the Blue School on the right side of the road there, towards that brook. That's all knotweed I've seen. That whole side of the road in the hill. That's just totally exploded in the last few years. Mm -hmm. the yeah. I think all the flooding has made it worse. It's it's showing up in all sorts of places. Yeah. All along Route 16 and Conway. All of it, it's bad. Really bad. Okay. Yeah, it, it in fact it can propagate by fragmentation. So like when you got like when Irene came and you saw that huge scour along the Deerfield River. A lot of that was, you know, all these big beds of knotweed were basically scoured out. And when you look at it, you almost start to smile until you realize <clears throat> that all those plant fragments that went downstream are going to root somewhere else and start whole new areas of invasion. So <clears throat> that's the other problem with mechanical control is, you know, we had a situation where a landowner was trying to control it by mowing it right along the banks of the, of the Westbrook. And it's like, no, make sure you don't control. <laughs> fragment those pieces and because if they drift downstream it's just going to establish somewhere else yikes <laughs> all right well that's really good that's very helpful thank you um now i'll talk more with evan and um i guess i'll be having a call with um with uh the mvp folks at some point to just discuss the expression of interest and um and sort of um expand more on um on what what they would like to see and then uh you know we'll pick other locations that that seem like they would be really beneficial to work in but evan's pretty open to um you know any guidance we have and and uh he's quite experienced so um i, I think it could be a cool project yeah would they have any, the question for you scott would they have anything through heritage like signage or like interpretive if they do like a flower like in pollinator flower bed like by by the library or the town hall like some you know to show the public what's going on or hmm. I don't think natural heritage would be a source for that but there may be other people who've done it you know mm -hmm. um you know, might might talk to people at nasami farm whether the native plant trust might have some educational information about you know landscaping with native plants that might also talk about pollinators and pollinator habitat. Yeah. yeah. And I think landscape interactions, like part of what they do is they like to um, have projects that demonstrate um, different abilities of uh, working with, um, with pollinator habitat creation in terms of like uh, if there's 
you know, areas that are experiencing a particular problem, what what sort of plants can be chosen that are appropriate to help with that problem, and then they can they can share that with people in the community and have like you know portfolio of seeds and stuff of what types of plants are um, appropriate for the area in which you're working. So I think that they part of what they do is also education and and part of what go into the planning processes like meeting with the community and and getting ideas and feedback on um designs and just um letting people know what what the notion is that we're we're working with okay well i guess i would suggest if anybody has any brainstorms uh, or ideas uh, just reach out to sylvia and let, let her know um Yes, please we do. We did talk about this at one of our meetings, and I passed on that feedback. So um, uh, we can continue to think about it and see what what comes up. Yeah, and if uh, also just generally, if if uh, there's something that you all um, are working on, and I haven't been um, good about getting to your meeting or something, um, I'd I'd love to help with whatever uh, sorts of things you think would be most important to seek out funding to to um to deal with in the town so just uh always let me know um if i can help in some way sounds good thank you sylvie thank you i'm gonna sign off just because i think my phone's going to die anyway but <laughs> i'll talk to you all soon no problem good to see you you too good night good night Bye. All right. So next item of business is that uh, certificate of compliance for Nasami Farm. Um, the th three out of George joined us uh, for the site visit. There was not a whole lot to look at. It was essentially what we expected. They uh, they built the building. That it all looks good. We didn't see any problems. Any any other comments, Andrew or uh, or Ann? Yeah. No issues. So straightforward. So I would suggest that we uh, issue the certificate of compliance and uh, I don't see any need for conditions to any of you. No. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. I will get the paperwork out. I'll need to uh, drop off a signature sheet at the town offices uh, for you to sign. I'll try to do that tomorrow morning and I'll send out a message once it's it's ready for you. Um, next is the minutes of our last meeting. Any comments on the minutes, the draft minutes? They looked fine. Mm -hmm. All right. All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Thank you. And I think that's all I have in terms of our regular agenda. Are there other uh Topics you'd like to talk about? Any questions or comments? Uh, I had one question for you, Scott, on other meeting stuff. The shared agent, can that be used like for the Ag Commission was looking for like a secretariat? Is that like the same one that there was still possible like we were going to use? Could they use that as well in other, in other town commissions or town boards, I should say? Um. I don't think it's going to work out that way. I mean, we're going to have six towns sharing an agent and six conservation commissions sharing an agent. Mm -hmm. I think once we add more commissions, it's just going to get very complicated. Uh, the other thing is, is that I know that um, Williamsburg would like to have somebody that's more than a secretary, more than an administrative person, somebody with some expertise. So I don't think taking minutes for other boards would really be a welcome addition to that job description if you want to attract some somebody uh, yeah, with, uh, yeah, can I just with a good background. That makes sense. Yeah. I was just like, just saw some emails between Donna, Judy, and Alan. I was like, I thought it was just very specific to like con and stuff. Yeah. I didn't want to yeah. get like a... Yeah, no problem. You can always ask, but uh, yeah. I don't think it's going to work in this case. Yeah. Thanks. Any other business? All right, well, I'm going to wrap this up and stop the recording.